I want to talk about God's healing love today. God's healing love. Something interesting I was reading in uh, what was said about love in general. What science has discovered, love influences all aspects of human existence. Love is powerful medicine. Healthy relationships can protect against disease and restore the body in the face of illnesses. Without loving relationships, humans fail to flourish, even if all their basic needs are met. Wow. Love loss, L-O-S-S, in quote, is one of the most powerful forms of stress and trauma. This is what science had to say about love in general. But we want to talk about God's healing love. The healing power of God's love. A few weeks ago, the Lord said, I want you to Begin preaching, theme preaching, or series preaching. Take a theme and begin to, uh, for a few weeks, for a few services, talk about it. And um, so it's going to cause growth. Growth. The more you know about something, the better it is, right? We need love. If human love... If God or, or human love can do that and science has discovered something wonderful about wholesome relationships, how much more can the love that comes from God do much more? So God wants us to know that he loves us. How often do you look around at society? How often do you look around and see what's going on in our world and feel challenged by God's concern or what you feel is God's concern. God is always concerned. God never change. He's always the same. The Bible says Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. And another scripture says, I'm the Lord. I change not. God never changed. So it's, it's good to know that God doesn't change. When you find yourself in um, adverse circumstances, you don't have to wonder whether or not God is concerned about what you're facing. God is always concerned. And um, so we talked about understanding and receiving God's love. We talked about seeing his love in justification tribulations and propitiation, seeing and understanding and receiving God's love, even when you go through trials, even when you uh, look back at the cross and understand there's no greater kind, there's no greater love when the Savior came from above to give his life. We talked about God's love and kindness, a deep felt personal love coming from God and is seen as seen through creation through the law of Moses and through the cross. The law of Moses was, was designed to amplify sin, to cause us to understand what sin really did and how bad it is, so that when it comes time for the cross, we are Jesus' grace, then we can uh, wholeheartedly embrace the grace, understanding that we and ourselves cannot please God apart from his grace. And uh, so the law served a good purpose. And then the cross, as you well know, where Jesus shared his, shared his life that we might have life. God, we talked about uh, last week, God's love shown in the great transition. We pass from death to life. I don't know if you grasp how 
great this is, but when you see where you're going, it means more to you. We are headed for eternity, to spend eternity with God. That is so powerful. That is so wonderful. It's worth, uh, it's, it's the kind of motivation that should keep us going when we feel a little discouraged. It's the kind of motivation that when you look back at the cross and look back or look in the book of Revelation and see where you're headed and the things that's going to happen to those that are not on board. It should give us the motivation to do our best for God. Isn't that right? God is faithful. He gave his best for us. So we, uh, um, today we're going to talk about God's healing love. I remember on one particular t situation I was trying to help a young person and that uh, young person had a real desire that her parents come back together. They were separated. And um, so they called me and asked if I could, they could talk to me. They're not here in the church, so don't try to figure. <laughs> They're not here. And um, so I agreed. And uh, I remember praying and praying for the person and God began to talk to me and said, he said, son, the basis for all my healing is my love. And you, you know, you look at John 3, 16 and you see the motivation behind God giving his son, right? He so loved that he gave his only son. How many will give your only in anything. But he gave his only son because he loved you and I. Keep in mind, we were enemies. But he gave his only son for us because he looked beyond our faults and he saw our need. He knew that man needed a savior. He saw the lostness of humanity and it moved him to do something about it. I don't know about you, but uh, if, if the love that you have don't move you to do something every now and then, you, you might want to question the type of love that you have. Isn't that right? God so loved. No, he could have sat back and says, mm, mm, mm. lost humanity, sad, sad, sad. <laughs> but he didn't. <laughs> Isn't that right? God so loved, I love that. He so loved that he gave his only begotten son that all to make me want to love him more. Amen. Hallelujah. A healing love. So when God uh, healed and you, you know it's just uh, God saying I love you just reminding you that I love you when he heals hallelujah now I want to look at the few in the Bible here that God put on my, put on my heart uh, we want to look at God's healing love shown to the hopeless the hopeless is defined, the term hopeless is defined as feeling or causing despair about something. You know, when a person feels hopeless, they may feel like nothing good can happen to me. They may feel despondent and uh, resign or re to do anything. Gloom, melancholy. Sorrow, misery, discouragement, and the list can go on when a person feels hopeless, that there's no hope. And many times we are put into situations as God's people, uh, and the situation may look very hopeless. We cannot see 
an end. We cannot see a change. We, we look at it from a natural point of view. And, and because we can't figure out with all of our figuring what, how it can change, sometimes hopelessness want to set in. But we're never, ever hopeless without God, with God. God is hope. And God can create something out of nothing. God can make a way when there seemed to be no way. The Bible says he calls things that be not as though they were. He looked at Israel, I remember in one of the prophets and we were reading and as he, he was reminding Israel of his greatness and his mercy and his love, he said that you were, you were left there. Basically the cord had never been cut and you were lying there in your blood. And he said, I passed by you, Israel. I saw you in that state. And he said, I spread my skirt over you. And I spoke to you and I said, live. And you began to live. Hallelujah, Jesus. God is a good God. He's a great God. He was reminding Israel, you know, God does so many good things for us. And sometimes it's good to be reminded that things aren't as bad as they seem. Isn't that right? God is good. In him we're moving and we are living and we have our being. But nevertheless, the hopeless, he said, he wanted us to look at uh, how he uh, showed his love to the hopeless. So I want you to uh, look at this text here in John. He was uh, in John 5. The Bible says, a feast of the Jews. He went up to Jerusalem. And there at Jerusalem was a sheep market, or by the sheep market, a pool which it's called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, or Bethesda, having five porches. These, now I want you to pay attention to this, in these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, a great multitude, a lot of them, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. And I want you to try and picture this scene. Just so many blind, lame, deformed, withered up people that were just had no hope when you look at their condition. And the Bible says, for an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Glory to God. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had and the Lord was pointing to me it's like look at my compassion here was like a sea of people a multitude of people that was impotent all kinds of physical ailments and diseases there they lay just waiting hoping that one of them would be able to get into the water and they had to be attentive and alert because if it, the water starts to stirring and they were just not paying any mind and somebody was paying attention, that person that was paying attention would probably rush to the pool to, and jump in to get help. And so the person that was not paying attention may have to wait another season. Ever how long that may have been. But I want you to picture this because what happens is uh, uh, the, the mercies of God, God saw the condition of these people. Uh, he wasn't looking on the scribes and the Pharisees that had it all together. He wasn't looking at those people. He was looking at those that felt hopeless in their condition, in their situation. Here's the mighty savior of the universe coming down from above to show his love to the society of people that felt very hopeless and in despair. It makes me wonder, are we tuned into the heart of God? It, it makes me think sometimes, are we tuned into the heart of the Almighty? It makes me think. Because the Bible is full of instances 
where there were people that felt very hopeless. And here, although Jesus uh, had visited this place and the Bible makes it clear, this sea of people that were so sick and helpless and deformed, never expecting things to change. But there was one, there was one that was worse than perhaps many of them there because he could not function on his own. So, I, I, you know, it's like God taking an isolated miracle and began to show his kind of compassion that he has for humanity. So here this man, the Bible says, a certain man, verse 5, was there which had an infirmity. How many years? That's a long time. I don't know how much hope a person would have in receiving something from God if they've been believing for that long. He had the sickness for 38 years and when Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he says to him, will thou be made whole? And you know that's a very valid question. Why is it valid? Because sometimes when we've been in a condition so long, we no longer expect any difference. We accept it that that's just the way it is. And so Jesus comes to this man here and asks him, do you want to be made whole? The impotent man answered, sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. And so what the Lord was pointing out to me concerning the helpless man here. Look at my compassion, he said. No, the Savior, it wasn't time at the time for him to come and do these great miracles. But God had left a little ray of hope. He would send an angel down. Now what would happen if there was no angel that would ever come? They would just be laying there year after year, year after year. And so God always leaves his people with a, a ray of hope. No matter what we go through the Bible says um, with the temptation God will make a way of escape right that we may be able to bear it God never leaves us hopeless always does so we see this man here and then when he looked in Jesus uh, uh, and the other point I look thing I want to point out is that he was trusting in man something that was not going to work. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? He was trusting in the help from man that was not going to work. I heard the scripture that says vain is the help of man. Vain is the help of man. Futile and useless is the help that comes from man. Look at somebody say, we got to look up and put our trust in God. All right. So we see concerning the hopeless that this man was saying, sir, my problem is this. I can't get there fast enough when the water's stirred. And I ain't got nobody that care enough for me that will help me get in the pool. Anybody, feel, anybody understand what I'm saying? Now here he was living that way hoping that somebody would have mercy on him. Don't this happen to us many times in life? We're looking for someone to help and then, but you won't do that. But sometimes you may go further and say, well, the preacher don't even care. 
I, I, well, y'all don't do that, but sometimes people do that. But now let me share with you what happened here. He says, do you want to be made whole? The man tells his problem, and then Jesus startles this man. He says, rise, take up your bed, your mat, your pallet, and do what? Walk. Now here's another challenge. Here's another challenge. The man can say, are you crazy? If I could walk, I wouldn't be here. Y'all ain't hear what I'm saying. God always will put a challenge before you if you're going to get your miracle. Isn't that right? Hear this man and, and, and see logic can't get involved there. If you do, you can miss the miracle power of God. Sir, I ain't got nobody to help me. Then he said, well, just take up your mat and go. Did you just hear what I said? <laughs> I love Jesus. He's something else, boy. He'll challenge you. But when the man did what he said, the Bible says, and immediately the man was made whole, took up his bed and walked. And on the same day with the Sabbath, oh, there was a problem there. Yeah. But the hopeless, God brought hope to a hopeless situation. And I got news for you. God will bring hope to your hopeless situation. It doesn't matter what it is. Because he said he'll never change. Isn't that right? Can you trust him enough? God says he never changed. I believe what he said. If God says I won't change, then that means what he did in that time. If I'm in a situation that makes me feel hopeless, then I know God can do something about it. I may can't figure it out with my mind, but I know God can do something about it. Because the Bible, this is what Jesus, God made me see. He said, I want you to see my healing love. I healed a man. I healed a man. He was in a hopeless situation. Let's move on here. There was another one here um, uh, that's found in uh, Mark 5. Please turn there. I'm going to move a little more rapid if I can. Mark chapter 5. Verse 1, and they came over to the other side of the sea to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs and no man could bind him. No man could bind him. Y'all, you see what he's saying? No man could bind him, right? No, not with chains. Because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains and chains had been plucked asunder by him and the fetters broken in pieces. Neither could any man tame him. You see, they were trying to tame him because he was a wild man, right? So you can't, can't lose this man in society. So, you know, they tried to chain him, but every time they'd chain him, he'd just pop him loose like there was a, a, a thread. And always night and day he was in the, can I pause you and say this here? Demon can be strong. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying, cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus from far off, he ran and worshiped him and cried with a loud voice and said, now this was the spirit talking to him, through him. What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. Well, Jesus spoke directly to the spirit. He said to him, come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he goes on and asks him his name. And, he, and then the spirit spoke and says, my name is Legion because we are many. And he knew he had to go, so he began to plead. That's what happens sometimes when demons know they got to go. They start pleading. Sometimes they fall down and cry. If you see it in the spirit, they'll, when they're getting ready to go, they, they know they got to come out. They'll start crying, just crying and pleading. But Jesus did not yield to that. Amen. Then he said, well, can we, can we go into the herd of swine? Please don't send us out of the country. He said, Go. I like that. You know, Jesus didn't have to go through no changes. He didn't have to spend no hours, you know what I'm saying? And say, hook a Messiah, hours and hours and hours and praying and so on. He said, go. Powerful command. Hallelujah. Glory to God. 
My God. So the man was made whole. Now, look at the verse um, 19. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, because he wanted to go home with, continue with Jesus. Um, Jesus allowed him not. He said, go home to your friend, tell them how great things the Lord has done for you and have had compassion on you. Look what he said, go home. Go home to your friend. Now, I want you to look at Luke chapter 8, that same uh, uh, one. Okay, Luke 8, verse 39. It's the same uh, uh, situation. Uh, verse 38 says, now the man out of whom the devils were departed besought him that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away saying, return to your own house and show how great things God has done to thee. You see, what God was, was, was showing me is like, you know, sometimes people are in situations of despair and so on and, and they're not functioning right. And they become a problem to their family members. And so when God healed the man, he was concerned. He said, go home to your family. There are some situations where when people need a lot of help, God wants the family to benefit too. Isn't that right? God is concerned for the family, you know. And, and so that, he was pointing that out to me. Jesus cares for the family. And uh, now we go on here. God shows his healing love. But the point is, you see how God did this man. He healed him. And uh, in another passage that talks about the same um, incident said this man they saw him sitting and clothed in his right mind totally different he was no longer naked he was no longer cutting himself with stones no longer living in the, in the graveyard but he had, came, he had his clothes on can God do something saints God is able this is, this is our Lord that, that, that we, we worship each day. This is who we serve and we worship. So I believe God wants to inspire hope in our lives. He wants, wants us to understand it's never hopeless when you have God. There's always hope. God can make a way where there seems no way. God can do what's impossible for anybody else to do. God is God. That's hallelujah. And he's able. So, and so, so as we, we get stirred up a little bit, well, God, you know what? I'm going to trust you for the situation of mine that I've been in for so long. And I'm not going to complain to him. I'm going to begin to believe you for this thing, right? And that's what God wants to show us how it's never hopeless. The second thing is God's healing love shown to the outcast. Outcast is a person who has been rejected by society or a social group, excluded, looked down upon, ignored, mentally ill, a loner, rejected by peers because they're different, strange, inept, or misunderstood. God, he said, I want you to see my healing love to the outcast. Those that people don't want to be bothered with. Now turn to Luke 17, if you will. They had this song, I want to be more like Jesus. I, you, you probably heard it. What kind of man would wash men's feet? He kicked around and turn the other cheek. Have you ever heard people sing that song? I want to be more like Jesus. He says, I didn't get no amens. And nobody would be like this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Amen. Okay, here's the situation with the 10 lepers. Luke 17 here. Look at starting verse 11. And it came to pass 
as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off or at a distance. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, go show yourself to the priest. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God, fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. Now look at Jesus here. Listen to what he asked him. And Jesus answered, answering said, were there not 10 cleansed? But where are the nine? Jesus was actually looking for them, or it seems to imply that he was looking for all 10 of them at the point when the manifestation of the miracle took place that they would go back and give thanks and reverence to God for what he had done. Look at the emphasis. This is what God said. Look at the emphasis, that's, uh, the value that he placed on thanksgiving. Could it be sometimes that we are not thankful enough? Could it be sometimes that the more God does for us, sometimes we may not just show him the love and appreciation that he deserve he placed the emphasis on being thankful then he said there are not found that return to give glory to God save this stranger and he said to him arise go thy way thy faith have made thee whole somehow or another this man got the full benefit and I believe this is my personal belief that the more grateful we are, the more we can get the full benefit of God's love. Isn't that right? God bless you all. Good to see you. <laughs> and so, the being thankful, that's what just spoke to my heart. Because, you know, you're going to always have problems. Isn't that right? You're going to always have something that you need to pray about. Isn't that right? God's going to see to it that you're always going to have something to call on God about. But the beauty is when we understand the value of just plain being thankful to God. The Bible says be thankful unto him and bless his name. Isn't that right? I believe if I change, I believe if you decide today, let's change our attitude and stop complaining so much and let's stop looking at what's so bad in society and on the television and in the, in the cities if we kind of begin to shift our eyes a little bit and begin to say our God reigns and begin to thank him because God is faithful he's going to bring to pass what he said he said heaven and earth shall pass away but not my word for my word will not return to me void but it's going to accomplish what I please if we can just see a little bit like Jesus sees. He said, were, were there not 10? Yeah, they were 10. But were, were, were there nine? He could have said, wow, this, yeah, thank you, son. You know, you, you, you recognize this. But the focus was, where are the rest of them? All 10 of them got cleansed. Being thankful is what he kind of spoke to my heart. We have to be thankful. We have to be thankful. It's really, really important to see how God sees things. And when we're grateful, and I remember him telling me this before, he said, Thanksgiving plays a very important part in your Christian experience. If you're thankful, God can work things out. Hallelujah. He can work and make it a way when there seemed to be no way. Hallelujah. Okay. All right. So we see his love to the outcast. And then, you know, I find out that I find that sometimes when a person is in a situation so long of 
then there is an attitude that forms. There's a way of looking at things that has to be changed. I've been there myself. And God had to deal with me about how you view things. You know, do you still have faith? Are you still expecting God to do something? It's so important, saints. And uh, so this the same way with this here, uh, uh, these people, although they were lepers and so on, and you, you would think that if a man was isolated, separated from society as an outcast, and when Jesus came, you know, the Bible said they were at a distance. They couldn't come close, right? And so when they were isolated from society, I don't know how long it was, and then when Jesus told them, go show yourself to the priest, and when they discovered that they were healing, healed, you think they would come running back say, oh, my God, I can go back to my family. I can go back. Now I don't have to be living by myself. I don't have to feel contaminated. And the, word, and the Lord, that, that word came to me, contaminated. They, they, they were contaminated. They felt, I can't get close to people and so on. But... When they, when they got healed, saints, are y'all hearing what I'm saying? When God changed their situation, you would think they would have said, Lord Jesus, I'm forever grateful for you, Lord. I, I don't know the Messiah that well, but all I know is he just gave a word and I got healed. I am so grateful for this. None of the Jews came back. To say thank you. It was a Samaritan. The one that they call half breeds. Ponder this. Ponder this. And so. Thanksgiving was placed. Moving right along. God. The third thing is not only did the healing. God's healing love shown to the outcast. But God's healing love shown to the widows. These are the ones that he gave me, these. And so uh, <clears throat> let's look at, go back to Luke 7 this time. We're almost done. Luke 7, verse 11. And it came to pass the day after that he went into a city called Nain. That word means lovely. And many of his disciples went with him and much people. And when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother. She was a widow and much people of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, weep not. And he came and touched the bier or the coffin. And they that bare him stood still and he said, young man, I say unto thee, arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to talk. You think the crowd scattered? <laughs> <laughs> and began to speak, and he delivered him to his mother, and there came a fear on all, and they glorified God saying that a great prophet is risen up among us and that God had visited his people. And this rumor of him went forth throughout all Judea and throughout all the region round about. And the disciples of John showed him of all these things. What I want to pause and say this is that I believe God is getting ready to do some astounding miracles. But he's got to condition our minds. Sometimes you can be a long time in a state until you can't think right. You know what I'm saying? You can't think like God wants you to think. And uh, I believe this is a part of what God wants to do is elevate our thinking as to who we're really serving. I see people look so sad outside as I'm looking. But hear what I'm saying. Hear what I believe God is saying. It's been a long time. God knows it's been a long time. 
But we're in the time where God says, I'm going to do something about it. But you know, those Bible students, you know what goes before the victory. You know that before you get any miracle, you're going to have to praise him. Yeah, you can't ask God to change the Bible for you. Isn't that right? Although God said this is the time, I know what he's been saying to me. If you believe it, praise me. If you believe it, praise me. If you believe it, praise me. Somebody said, I praise him, ain't nothing happen. <laughs> I, I, I hear you. <laughs> but praise him with an understanding that he can't lie. He can't lie. He can't lie. Faith. Faith. Now the just shall live by. 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 Without faith. Somebody says, I've been here so long, I'm so tired. I'm just so tired. I'm just, God, I'm just over it. I'm so tired. God said, but did you praise me? Am I not worthy? You, see, you remember the, uh, the Naaman the Syrian? He gave him a simple task. Go dip in the pool of, uh, the, go dip in the river of Jordan. And he fussed all the way. <laughs> His servant had to tell him, my Lord. Now, he, if he had given you a hard thing to do, wouldn't you have done it? But he didn't give you a hard thing. He just said, praise him. I know some of y'all frustrated with this, but I'm trying to get a point that God is sharing with me. It's been, how long has he been talking to the living word about praising him? Come on, y'all. I mean, duh. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> when we praise God, when we praise God, the atmosphere changes. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. I, rem I remember preaching a, a message, preparing the way for the king. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and in that message, you know, when you want to roll out the red carpet for the king of glory, you, how you, you know, you praise him. And when you praise him, you invite him. He want to come. He belong in it. When you find yourself glorifying God, giving him honor in a situation that's deplorable, where you're praising him and magnifying him and giving him thanks, God begin to say, I need to go there in that situation and once he shows up he may not come when you want to now, 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 now this, this widow at Nain here uh, uh, one of the things that he pointed out this he said Jesus showed up just in time this widow it was a sad day and the Bible was very careful so that somebody can say, well, that was, she wasn't spirit, she wasn't really dead, dead. There was a funeral procession. There was a coffin. Yeah. Everything that said that he was dead, dead. <laughs> Is that right? 
So scholars can't study and say, no, no, it really, he, he really wasn't. No, he was dead. <laughs> but Jesus. Hopeless situation. Many of us are in situations where we need God's miracle power. But what I share with you is what I really believe God is saying. Faith must be activated. Amen. With faith, we please him. God dwells in the right presence. God dwells in the midst of a praising people. Right? And when and one of the prophets said they began to thank and to praise the Lord. God sent an ambushment on their enemies. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Praise is comely to the upright. Whoever offers praise glorifies me. I can just, I can just sense people saying, yeah, you know, I know. I, I done heard that. I done heard that. And some says, I done tried that, you know. But saints, hear what I'm saying today. God's talking to us. He's ready to work, but it's still faith. Are you hear what I'm saying? Come on, let's begin to praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Come on, give him some praise. Give him some praise. He's worthy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lamb. God is worthy to be praised. God is worthy to be praised. God is worthy to be praised. The rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. Praise him, all ye saints. Praise him in the sanctuary. Praise him with the instrument. Praise him with high sound and cymbal. Praise him with the low sound and cymbal. Praise him with the instruments of ten string. Praise the Lord. Let everything that have breath praise the Lord. Praise him. He's worthy of praise. Praise the Lord. Not when you feel like it. Praise the Lord. He's the God of the oppressed. He's the God of the oppressed. Hallelujah. He's deserving of praise. Glory and honor and thanksgiving and power unto the Lord. The glory to the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is to be praised. We do not want to insult his honor by not praising God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to God. We, we don't want to insult his dignity and his honor. He's such a great God and he, he's brought us out of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his son. Hallelujah. Praise, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. He'll show up in your situation. He'll show up in my situation just in time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. He'll be there. He'll be there. He'll be there. Don't you worry. He'll be there in your situation. Hallelujah, for the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. Praise, hallelujah, will still work for us today. Praise will still work for us today. God inhabits praise. You know, when you fast and pray, demons come to try to oppress. I'm aware of that. They come and try to oppress people and make them feel, well, this ain't happening and so on. Uh, but let me encourage you today. God is faithful. He is a faithful, faithful, faithful God. And he's not going to disappoint you. He's going to bless you. He's going to bless you. Thank you, He's going to bless you. 
He's going to bless you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, we thank you. We praise you. We honor you now. You know, it took me, it took me a long time to realize that God was trying to establish my heart on biblical principles. And when he would say, do this, I would look at what I was going through. And it went on for years looking at what I was going through, feeling distraught. And one day he said, son, I'm trying to establish you. And I said, what do you mean? He said, I'm trying to set your heart up on sound biblical principles. You praise him, the rest is history. He'll take care of it. Hallelujah. Because the Bible says he'll make a way where there seemed no way. Isn't that right? He can make a way, hallelujah, in the wilderness. God is our refuge and strength and a very present help in trouble. Glory to God. I have to tell you that because I know what the oppressor is trying to do. He's trying to oppress you because some were pressing into God. He loves you with an everlasting love. Our Father, we praise you and we magnify you right now. I ask that your precious Holy Spirit would minister, Lord God, to each heart, Lord, that something would birth inside of your people today, a revelation concerning praise. We magnify you. We bless you because you're wonderful and because you're excellent in all of your ways. None is so great. None is so kind but you. None really has our interest at heart. What you did for the hopeless, what you did for the outcast, what you did for the widow, what you did and what you did for the ones that were oppressed of the devil. And he reminded me that people are being oppressed. Oppressed by demons, oppressed by physical condition, oppressed by finances, oppressed by relationships, oppressed by spouses, but oppressed. And God is the same today. He'll do you good. He'll do you good. Can we just stand and begin to just praise and thank the Lord for his goodness and for his Holy Spirit, for his holy presence. Thank you, Lord. Just offer praise right where you are. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Master. Thank you because you're so wonderful and because your mercy endure for